from Microbe TV. This is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 142, recorded on November 14th, 2017. This episode is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron is the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. Get $30 off your first delivery and free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash twip. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me here in New York City, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent. And Daniel Griffin. Hello, everybody. Hello, Daniel. <laughs> Daniel is in studio today. He is. Today was a special day. Or it's a really uh, fantastic hologram that we're looking at. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Every day's special, but today was more special than the this other is, special this days. This is very true. We, Every uh, day is special, yeah. Yeah, we just yeah. finished uh, recording, doing the recording part of our new uh, parasitic diseases video series. Exactly. And now there's just a Herculean amount of work left Editing. for our producer, <laughs> That's right. Vince, in here. And by producer, you're actually not just the guy who puts up money. You're the guy who actually does all the work. Exactly. Producers can have different uh, duties depending on what, what they're involved in. So, you know, we typically think of a producer as putting up money or raising money for a movie. Yeah. Right. But on smaller projects like this, the producer actually can film and edit and so forth. And no, I was once a producer on a movie. Oh yeah. Yeah, but I just gave, just gave money. Money. It was yeah. uh <laughs> it was called Waves and it was actually a documentary about Waves. women in the Navy, the first women in the Navy. Oh, boy. So a producer, according to the dictionary, uh, a movie producer is someone responsible for the financial and managerial aspects of making a film. They fill a variety of roles depending on the type of producer they are. They can coordinate aspects of film production, such as selecting a script, coordinating writing, directing, editing, arranging, financing, yeah. uh, etc. So you can have different roles. Then you've heard the term executive producer. They oversee all the other producers working on the project. <laughs> right. Yeah, more than what it sounds like a university. <laughs> That's right. All the administrators. That's exactly right. They sh make sure the producers are fulfilling their roles. Layer upon layer. And there's a line producer, which manages day-to-day -day operations. They get lunch. Supervising producer that manages the screenplay. Producer is the thing we just talked about. Then there's a co-producer, a coordinating producer, an associate producer, a segment producer, a field producer. A segment producer. He could have been very important for our tapeworm substance. Yes, exactly. Okay. <laughs> this is probably more than you wanted to know about producing. How about director? Well, the director directs the film. So you're the producer slash director. I didn't you're really. Both. I didn't really direct you, did I? Yeah, you were, you were a little bit good at it. Yeah. in a helpful in a helpful <laughs> manner. You were an enabler. Yeah. Well, it was my pleasure to participate. I hope it has a long life. Me too. I hope that my uh, throatiness disappears today too. When do you want to post the videos? What's your goal? Uh, we, I, we need to make a beta version first, and we have to have it reviewed by our clinical staff. And then we have to watch every. It takes. And a long we have time to, to watch, watch them all. all of it, and then we. I think we have some corrections to make also. But you know, we could always. You know, we, we could do, do the crowdsourcing thing. Um, you know, where we get it out there, and you know, we get some feedback, and then we could always re-release it, right? Because I'd like to see it out there. I want to see people you can totally modify right? this anytime. Yeah, because then you could always modify it and put it back up there. Okay. Totally. Totally. Like this totally. could be like our book, right? Every time somebody gives us something helpful, we modify it, and the electronic version is up to date. Exactly. But right. but yeah, for full disclosure, when I was a producer of the movie Homefront yeah. Heroines, The Waves of World War II, I did nothing but give money. <laughs> that's <laughs> no, not a bad job. Though. Nothing oh, else. <laughs> nothing else useful. <laughs> oh, that's pretty useful actually. Without that, you don't have a film, <laughs> <laughs> or you don't have film. Yeah, that that wasn't in any of the definitions. It said the producer arranges financing. Uh, I guess uh, pr providing money is arranging financing. Right? You bet. <laughs> I did. I arranged it. I arranged for the money to go from so, my account into. Uh, <laughs> so in the credits at the end, you got named as a producer. Yeah, produced by Daniel Griffin. And I have a copy. I gave a copy to my mom. You How nice. popular was the film? Did anyone? Come to see it? Um, you know, you can go, you can actually go to Homefront Heroines um, on the internet and you can, it's like us, you can watch oh, I would it. I'd love you to watch, watch it. I'm, so. I'm going to do that. 
Yeah. So mm-hmm. home front, and I, I think the you know it has like a little catch thing, What's and the name it was of it? say it again. It's home front heroines. Heroines. Oh, not heroin the drug, heroin. but heroines. <laughs> heroines. It's actually homefronthheroines.com is the site. Nice. And uh, the, the slogan was equal pay as men, designer clothes, and eventually respect. <laughs> and it's <laughs> actually respect. neat. It has a lot of footage of these women, and then sure. it actually has interviews like now. What are they doing? Oh, fantastic. Yes, I, I thought it was really a. I mean, it's uh, nice to give a lot of these women the recognition. Well, as a follow up on this, one of my classmates in high school produced a book not too long ago called Women Warriors. Her name is Jay Reed. And um, she produced a book about women in, in wartime. Wow. Irish. The Waves of World War II. Here it is. The Waves of World War II. Wow. Made important contributions, I'll say. Yeah. Unappreciated. What about the women who used to fly the B-25s over to Europe so that the Air Force could take them over? Oh, Those I didn't women know were about totally this. unheralded. Yeah. They were a wax, I believe, and uh, they would take off from like Halifax and Nova Scotia, places like mm. that, wow. and fly them across the Atlantic and then come back together and fly some more over. That's how they got there. All, All right, right. So Jane, should we do our case? Are we ready? Tell us about our case from last <clears throat> you week. You bet. Okay. This was our case from TWIP 141. 59-year-old Spanish-speaking female on Long Island who was originally from Guatemala. She came into the ER after returning from a 10-day trip to visit friends and relatives in Guatemala and El Salvador. Um, She had fever, cough, diffuse muscle aches, fatigue, chills. Um, A respiratory pathogen panel was done. It was positive for rhinovirus. Uh, They said, you know what? Just a virus. Go home. (laughs) Five days later, she comes back, fevers, chills, pain in the upper belly. She feels constipated at this point, and she's admitted. Uh, no past medical, surgical um, stuff to take note of. Uh, she doesn't report any allergies or significant family history. She is not on any meds. She's working cleaning houses. And um, as far as travel, when she did travel to Guatemala El Salvador, she says that she spent um, most of the time in and around the big cities, uh, lots of exposure to animals. She ate all the local fare, um, conch ceviche, fresh eggs, this flattened chicken dish she described for me. And uh, she is noted to have an elevated Y count, which is left shifted. Neutrophils are increased. The eosinophils are cleared. She ends up growing a salmonella, non-typhoidal species from her blood. Uh, I treat her initially with IV antibiotics. She gets better and she's just about to head out the door when a stool ova and parasites comes back and uh, observed was entamoeba coli, endolimax nana, blastocystis hominis, and uh, it was uh, cysts observed for the, the rare entamoeba coli cysts observed, endolimax nana trophozoites zoites were observed, and rare blastocystis hominis cysts were observed. Uh, we talked about the fact that these were all amoeba species, uh, so that no one would be confused with the other Nana. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and then we did mention that she ends up getting released to home. She sees us two weeks later. She's feeling fine. And then we had a bunch of questions, right? Like, right. what? Are, what? Are, what's going on here? Exactly. All right. We had a good number of guesses. We did. Because this week we're giving away a book. We are. Do you remember? I do. And it's a signed copy because... Two of the authors, three of the people are here. We'll all sign you're this You're going to sign it, and you're going you're gonna to mail it out, right? You give me the address, and I'll do it. Okay. You betcha. So we're going to number these and do a random number generation. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm, I'm going to be doing this, I'm afraid. It's just a virus. Go home. <laughs> exactly. What are, you, Dixon, what, are you still, what are you still doing here, young man? <laughs> Dixon, go home. Oh, my God. He's aerosolizing this room, Daniel. See, the point is- I know, and he turned towards me when he coughed. If Vincent was a physician- You're supposed to turn away. You turn away, cough towards Vincent. I, I covered my mouth. I covered my mouth. <laughs> he can work from home. I have to go to the hospital. <laughs> Daniel, when they put two fingers in your uh, inguinal and you cough, what are they looking for? Yeah, I don't do that. That's a hernia? It. Well, you know, <laughs> that, is what what they're, they that is what they're looking for. They turn your head and cough, and they're it's looking for- because I remember. Turn your head and cough. Yeah, and they they are they're looking for an, an inguinal hernia, and there's there's a little bit of a we'll call it a weakness um, where the cord comes through, so it's actually a hole, and you can have intestines hernia move mm-hmm. into that yeah. area. Right. So they're checking to see when you cough if there's a weakness there. So in high school, they used to do it to all of us routinely. You know, we'd go for with the doc, and 
I wonder what the frequency of discovering hernias is. is you know? And, and it, you also wonder, too, if they, like, what are you really going to do if the person's asymptomatic and it's not... Well, how would you to... detect it? You would feel the intestine cough, cough? You actually can feel the ring. And then when you cough, you could feel oh, um, intestines bulge through there. But, you know, if it's not symptomatic and it's not, what, what are you really going to do? I don't... So you don't do that? I think it's like taking out tonsils. It was something yeah. that they probably did a little more of than they needed yeah, to. I haven't, haven't, haven't had it done. Know, and it, was tra- it was always traumatic. Right? I, I, re- I remember. Um, it's weird, yeah. What is the opposite of fondly? Unfondly? I remember unfondly having to go through that. It was not, you know. Did you remember this, Dixon? Of course. Okay. Yeah, hopefully they've stopped. All right, the first email <laughs> is from Topher, who writes, Greeting Twipsids. That's a play on Capsids. Good. I'm not a professional in any way. Just a curious science enthusiast, so I'll keep my guess general and brief. One, rhino should clear up on its own. (laughs) Should, but, you know. Two, salmonella could account for most of not all symptoms. Antibiotics seem to clear it up. Three, the three suspects found later, from what I remember, don't generally cause any problems. Ah, he listened. Mm Mm-hmm. With the exception of maybe blastocystis, considering its question status as a known pathogen and the relief of symptoms after antibiotics, I would go ahead and Occam's razor this bad boy and go with salmonella being the cause of symptoms. I like that. Right. Ruling out an immunodeficiency disorder, I would imagine I too would be comfortable discharging her or on follow-up, I might do another white count. I'm not a medical or science professional in any way, so I usually don't guess, but I thought I'd throw my hat in the ring for the book. Can't win if you don't play. <laughs> That's great. All right. Daniel. Nicholas writes, Dear Doctors, congratulations for such an amazing podcast. I've been hearing it for some years, and this is my first time writing to you. I suspect that this case involves the clever and convenient use of a common treatment to tackle the three parasites at once. A fast search on Google revealed that indeed metronidazole is an effective drug against these three organisms. If these parasites were not described as rare, I would not suggest any treatment. After all, they are frequently found in stool samples in asymptomatic patients. My area of expertise in parasitology lies in the medical entomology branch, so I cannot give a more extensive answer. I suspect there is something else I am missing here, but I hope that this guess is right and in time for the next episode. Mm, Dixon. Connor writes, Hello, doctors mighty. (laughs) Firstly, loud shout out to all my classmates at Tulane School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine for finishing up medical helminthology last week. I'm glad to see that's still being taught. I am still primed to helminth-related information, at least I hope so, so my guests may have a bias. Gut reaction when hearing septicemia by gram-negative organism, leukocytosis with the eosinophils cleared, must be strongyloidiasis, strongyloides tercoralis. And the treatment is ivermectin and may be repeated at two weeks out. Very good she didn't get any corticosteroids and didn't have HTLV-1, I'm guessing. Uh, SS may not have shown up on an ONP because in low concentrations, or am I incorrect in my guess? I wanted to do more of a differential and throw out, throw in some neoplasms or other parasites and maybe even fungi because of the potential for one of those seventh edition books burning a <laughs> hole in your pockets. Actually, it's the sixth. Uh, it's the seventh edition is burning a hole in our memory. Uh, I, then I realized I should get back to a rickettsial disease assignment and summarize some medical protozoology lectures. Hope my gut didn't lead me astray. Nixon. Yes, Vincent. I heard you earlier today lamenting the fact that most medical schools have marginalized parasitology. That's now, true. here we have someone who clearly, in a school of public health anyway, ah. is being taught parasitology. This is a school of public health. And this so, is one of the ones that had a rich history of right. teaching. So it hasn't been marginalized in schools of public health, although here it has been. <laughs> right. <laughs> At Tully and I don't think it ever will be because they had some remarkable parasitologists there over the years mm. that made a, a huge impression on the field and still do, actually. So, um, And I was familiar with a lot of those people. And I'm glad to see that their legacy is still uh, in existence. It's interesting, right? I mean, the history, we'll get into this. Yeah. Of, um, I guess I have much to say about this 
very short email. Right? <laughs> exactly. um, the the concepts and the um, the verbiage, right? And words matter, and so it's the school of public health and tropical medicine. That's right. And those are mm-hmm. becoming um, maybe archaic terms. I'm going to suggest. Um, we used to talk about tropical medicine. We talked about public right. health. Then right. people started talking about international health, and the yeah. the current. Global. term is global health yeah, interesting right. mm-hmm. right. and I, I do think words matter and i think it is it's this right. increased understanding um yeah. that we're all part of one world that's right and that these borders are um they're political but they the diseases have no interest in these borders exactly. and with the immigration and movement that now viewing things as a global health uh, as we mentioned you have parasites here in the united states many parasites here in the United States. You don't need to be an international health person. So no, that's true. I think parasitology is very much part of global health. Right. And it'll be interesting as these schools go on, you know, will Tulane always be the Tulane school of public health and tropical medicine or yeah, will yeah. they transform yeah. into a school of global health? They probably already are a school of global health. They just probably haven't changed the name in many that's ways. True. That's true. The very first one in this country, as I recall, is at Johns Hopkins. <laughs> mm-hmm. And they were the, actually the first school of public health in the United States. And so they did a lot of training in this area to begin with. And malaria was still prevalent in the United States as an indigenous infection, or an autochthonous infection, I should say. So there was a good reason for maintaining the presence of tropical medicine in the United States. And, of course, we had uh, World War II. Which I mean, tropical medicine, um, you were just at the ASTMH. And we, were, we were talking in the elevator about 10% of the people there were military. That's correct. And so a lot of these, we'll use the term tropical medicine, a lot of these tropical medicine topics have had a major impact upon the U.S. This is true. Uh, because we send troops abroad. I'm, I'm trying to finish a book now about the Panama Canal and talk well, about... You're writing a book about the Panama Canal? No, no, Canal? reading. <laughs> <laughs> reading. <laughs> I will finish reading. <laughs> right. um, but no, it's amazing. You, you look at you know yellow yeah. fever, yeah. malaria, typhoid, right. the impact of all these diseases. And now that the U.S. military is in rather interesting parts of the world, they're struggling to understand and handle a lot of these other diseases that you wouldn't necessarily get at home. So. You're right. The the word hygiene in these departments, what, why was that? Does that mean health, basically? That's yeah, well, we it's, it started out as two different departments, actually. There was the American Journal of Hygiene. Health, right. And the American Journal of Tropical Medicine. And, so and then hygiene. they realized that a lot of hygiene yeah, gets rid of it. tropical diseases, and so they put them together, basically. Perfect. So today we don't use the word hygiene as much, right? We don't, but it's interesting you should bring that up, Vincent, because the recipient of the Walter Reed Medal, Mm -hmm. which is not given every year, it's given to someone who's made major contributions to the field of tropical medicine, was given to Scott Halstead. I'm sure you know who he is. Yeah, I do. Because Scott Halstead is a graduate of Columbia's medical school and went to work for the Rockefeller Foundation. Mm-hmm. as a liaison between the medical entomology groups that were studying dengue, and he became the world-leading expert on dengue fever at one point. Mm-hmm. And he became the president of the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. Try to guess what the title of his presidential address was. Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. No. It was, quotes, dot, 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 and hygiene. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and quotes. That was the title of his talk. And I had a chance to talk about that while I was I heard down him, there. I heard him talk this summer. Uh, hygiene is a set of practices performed to preserve health. Exactly. So would building an outhouse be considered hygiene? No question about it. Sure. If it's done properly. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yes. Yes, that's if the hole is deep enough, how's that? Yeah. And I guess also to hit on this, uh, this the next session, the next section of this email. Um, yes, I like the fact that they thought of strongaloides with a gram-negative yeah, bacteremia in someone from this part of the world. That's right. And I did go ahead and do a strongaloides serology. Ah. Um, now, they talk about um, the stool studies. Now, this would be the instance where if you were looking in the stool, you would find larvae mm. instead of the eggs. So that exactly. would be. Um, and also HDLV1. I'm very sensitive to the fact that that is not just something in um, Okinawa. Yeah. But there are there are large pockets, pretty significant prevalence. The Dominican uh-huh. Republic has an area. If you remember this gentleman, Sweet, who described a, a skin manifestation, it was in Jamaica, I believe, mm. and it was due to this virus, HTLV1. So um, people from these endemic areas, I will often look, people with HTLV1 infection have a challenge controlling strongoloides. Right. So this, this could have been a very interesting uh, case, and I've seen cases where seen some really horrible cases, unfortunately, in children where they have HTLV-1, 
which compromises their immune system because it tends to create a um, an expansion of T uh, regulatory cells. Right. Right. So sort of making their body more tolerant. Uh, and then really bad strongyloides super infection. And the strongyloides, it's it's an animal. So when it enters, it actually it defecates inside us, and the the feces has E. coli. So you can end up with gram negative bacteremia, gram negative meningitis sure. from strongyloides. So the, yeah. these are all very. This is a very sophisticated email, I would say. Yeah. Mm. So all right, good job, yeah, Connor. All right, Dan writes, dear Twiff Troika, I've been tempted back by the chance to win a signed textbook. Sorry to hear about the loss of ads. I hope this leads to more people supporting Microbe TV on Patreon. This was a nice case. I had to convert 103 degrees to Celsius, <laughs> but that's pretty high. Yeah. The clinical and lab findings point to enteric fever caused by Salmonera enterica, serovar typhi, or paratyphi. Respiratory symptoms are common, and the positive test for rhinovirus was falsely reassuring. <laughs> Migrants returning to their country of origin are often at higher risk of typhoid fever, being less likely to observe food and water precautions or to receive travel vaccines. Moving on to the protozoa, Entamoeba coli and Endolimax nana are commensal organisms, passengers, not pathogens. Blastocystis, as we know, is mostly harmless. None require treatment. At the follow-up visit, I'd request a stool culture to exclude asymptomatic carriage of typhoid bacteria. Best regards, Dan. No, I think that was good, Dan. And I did make a mention of, in our last time, I didn't mention whether it was typhoidal or non-typhoidal salmonella. Uh -huh. But that's important to think about in someone from this part of the world. One of the names, one of the other names, the common name for um, salmonella typhi or typhoid is enteric fever. And I always like to tell people it's enterically acquired fever because they often don't have diarrhea. They have constipation. Interesting. Um, so I think that's important because people would think, well, she doesn't have diarrhea. Right. I don't need to worry. But, right. um, and fortunately in this case, it was a um, non-typhoidal salmonella species. So interestingly enough, while I was at the meeting in Baltimore, I had to pick a session to go to. So I picked global medicine. Mm -hmm. And we had one entire morning's worth of enteric salmonellosis. <laughs> it was all about two to five-year-old kids who were dying all over the world from this infection mm -hmm. and uh, how to prevent it and why it's so prevalent. Mm -hmm. So it's still with us and it's still a problem. Yeah, and it's it's tough because they seem like they're getting better and then you can end up with these intestinal perforations. Yeah, they and so, about that too. Yeah, it's a difficult Difficult disease. And again, it's all about hygiene. Exactly. Right? So exactly. it's all about access to clean water, That's right. hand washing. That's correct. Um, one of the little things that I, I've been telling people lately is they did a study where, you know, those alcohol things that they use to wash your hands? Mm. They noticed that people that wash their hands a lot, you actually can detect a serum level of alcohol in the blood. <laughs> so the initial study was was a falsely, you know, positive test for serum alcohol, but actually it's I'm not sure it's false. So interesting. I think if you wash your hands enough, you're gonna get a little bit. So if you've had a really rough day at the hospital, just wow. wash your hands a lot. I <laughs> should uh, unwind. <laughs> You'll feel so much better in the morning. Daniel earlier actually, you'll wake up with a headache. You were talking about draining a cyst and then filling it with ethanol. Yeah. Wouldn't that make the patient drunk? I'd take, um, I'd take <laughs> drunk over, over kind of caucus granulosis. Yeah, only, only if it actually got into the system. But no, when you put it into a localized area like that. No, Doesn't no. get into the system? No. 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 And sometimes they use How big? Are, what are we talking, a fist size cyst or much smaller? We're talking a fist size. We're talking so about a, big a five volume. centimeter, you know, big Why would, two, three so inches. So where does the ethanol go? It doesn't stay forever. Right? It goes in there. Right, yeah. you let it dwell for tw for ten minutes. We're talking about a kinococcus cyst oh, then here, take it out. and then you suck it back. I in. got it. So I that's the reaspiration. This is the pair. So the puncture, aspirate, instill the ethanol. Oh, okay, and then reaspirate the ethanol, and then you know you're not going to drink it at that point. No, it's a, it's just, no, so, no. So it, <laughs> groups use hypertonic saline instead, and actually that's where we're saying is now most groups have moved to the hypertonic. Saline. I like a eighteen year old Macallan in there. <laughs> <laughs> So with the aconococcus. Yeah. <laughs> Might as yeah. well get a good one while you're yeah. That's exactly yeah, In right. Ireland, I think they use Jameson. They, <laughs> they do, they do, they do. That's a joke for our listeners. <laughs> All right, uh, Daniel, there's one from Mike. Uh, Mike writes, hi guys. I'm guessing the woman's symptoms were due to the salmonella and the antibiotic took care of that. The results of the O&P showing entamoeba coli, 
Endolimex nana, and Blastocystis hominis are generally considered of low or non-pathogenicity in immunocompetent individuals. And since the patient is non-symptomatic, I would say she doesn't need any further treatment. Mike in Oregon. Right. All right. Dixon. Chris writes, Dear Twipsters, in Athens, Georgia, it's a rainy 54 degrees Fahrenheit or 12 degrees centigrade, but at least fall has finally arrived. I was thrown off by this case at first. There's a lot going on here, but after getting my bearings, I think it all makes sense now. The most relevant finding in this case is probably the salmonella cultured from the patient's blood and typhoid fever can account for all of her symptoms. According to the CDC, 5,700 cases occur in the U.S. each year, and a majority of those are acquired while traveling abroad. Her contact with animals in Guatemala may just be one of those red herrings, as there is no animal reservoir for Salmonella typhi. Instead, it is transmitted by fecal contamination and is more common in areas of poor sanitation. After being ingested, they can invade the bloodstream and cause fever. Infection is serious, and as many as 20% of cases are fatal. The three parasites identified in the patient's stool, Entamoeba coli, Endolamex nana, and Blastocystis hominis, are generally considered non-pathogenic commensals. While symptomatic infection is possible in each case, the symptoms do not align well with what we'd expect, and these protozoans are most likely of little clinical concern. We'll, we'll put a parenthesis around that. Even at the pa- as the patient's symptoms alleviate, she may be shedding salmonella. To ensure treatment was successful, a stool culture was likely performed prior to discharge and again two weeks later in clinic. If both cultures are negative for salmonella, this is encouraging evidence that she no longer harbors the infection. And as long as the intestinal protozoans are causing no problems, I don't see treatment being recommended for those. Yours commensally, Chris. Yeah, I guess interesting little bit of um, <clears throat> information I will add is the fact that um, her stool cultures never grew the salmonella. Ha <laughs> ha. Yeah, so interesting. That is fascinating. So in the beginning, he said the patient, the three parasites identified in the patient's stool, and then later he went on to refer to them as commensals, which is not a parasite. So I think we should correct the use of that term. So a parasite is something that derives its livelihood from the patient. And these organisms live in the large intestine and eat fecal matter. So that's something that the host probably could... It's, a, it's, an impre- it's an interesting <laughs> issue. Um, you know, it's sort of, it's, it's all about self-identity, I guess. Well, so if, if there is like one time when they're a parasite, do they now become parasitic or is it what they usually, you know, right? It's an they're interesting. They're opportunistic parasites. Yeah. That. Like they if have you a had, term for that. Yeah, like if you had someone who had an immune issue, yeah, right? And there are a couple of cases, I think, where people have sort of, you know, maybe here it was symptomatic or not, of or pap- the paper we discussed. So do they become parasitic and then they're always, you know. Right. I think if the immune system lets them in the door, then a lot of these organisms have the capacity to cause disease. I agree. Dan, you want to take that last one? Dear friends, here is another interesting case, and this is my guess. The presence of salmonella in the blood is sometimes found in cases of gastroenteritis, about 5%. Salmonella can also be considered a sentinel microorganism for certain diseases. Its presence in the blood could reflect an still undetected impairment in the cellular immune response as it is observed in lymphoma and HIV infection. Also, salmonella septicemia may present as a complication in some parasitic diseases. Schistosoma is one such example, and salmonella can remain stuck onto the wall of adult blood flukes. As a consequence, recurrent episodes of salmonella sepsis can occur. Another case is strongyloides. Strongyloides is in many ways a fascinating parasite. It is one of a few that can complete its life cycle inside its host. This is achieved by an auto-infection route where L3 larvae migrate through the intestinal blood vessels to the lungs and from there climb the respiratory tract and is diluted till it reaches to the intestinal tract again. While migrating, strongyloides can transport bacteria on its tegument or alternatively, Bacteria can pass through the small ulcers in the mucosa and gain access to the bloodstream. As a consequence, many patients with disseminated strongyloides die from bacterial sepsis. As Guatemala is not one of the Schistosomiasis World Health Organization list, my top guess would be strongyloidiasis. Serology is very sensible, 
but in this case could be less specific because cross-reactions with other nematodes. Several fecal samples must be requested until 12 in some cases, and since the number of larvae excreted could be extremely low. By the way, this infection is probably not acute, and she must have been infected some time ago, walking barefoot, for instance. And the fresh eggs could well have been the source of her salmonella infection. The fever, cough, muscle aches, fatigue, and chills could represent an episode of migrating larvae, the auto-infection cycle. Mm-hmm. Thanks again. Waiting for the next episode. And P.S. Dr. Depamier, what about the historical <laughs> heroes? No more episodes? I really liked it a lot. <laughs> what happened? So. Um, nothing happened. I can obviously include one into the next twip. You know, we, we have God, the, we have the book here, it. so we could actually just go through the ones that we, and, you know, you could even just read the little, you wouldn't have to do any work. Let's do it now. You just wouldn't have read. to do any work, Dixon. <laughs> we See, could do I'm it trying, now if you'd like. I'm trying to sell that. Would you like to do one now? We Maybe didn't, you don't have to do any work. <laughs> it's not. I'm That's not probably allergic why to you work. stopped, right, Dixon? Because it was no, too no. much work. <laughs> it's not too much work. He's a busy guy. Where's the book? It's right up there on the shelf. But before we before we grab that book, um, I had a bunch of comments. Please. Um, this is again. You know, we're getting some great emails this time. They are. Uh, well, the free giveaway, that's what's going to happen. Is, is that why the books are so good? Should, <laughs> I, I, is, should we give away a book every single time? Uh, we could. It's up to well, you guys. Let's, let's, let's do it for now. Let's make it a regular thing, mm-hmm. and then we can always stop. You know, like All a right. few hundred episodes from now, we run out of books. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you can do that. While you talk, I'll look up. Yeah, By the yeah, way, that the, was Tony from Spain. Yeah, so to- Tony from Spain. Um, I've been following what's going on there in um, in Barcelona, so some tough stuff going on, so our sort of thoughts, sympathies for all that. Hopefully it will work out in a peaceful way. But um, let's go through a couple of things that uh, he that uh, Tony brought up. Now, th- this was a case I just saw recently. I was going to say this was a real case, but now it's one I saw recently. So a lot of the things that were brought up here were things that we had to consider. Uh, we did do an HIV uh, test because salmonella bacteremia can be associated with HIV infection. And uh, we looked for that. She was HIV negative. Uh, strongyloides. I mentioned the serology was negative, but as may have come up in other, you know, the serology is not a hundred percent. It might be closer to 90%. So you might miss like 10% of cases. So, um, some people will take a patient like this and just treat them saying, you know what, you're from the area. It's, um, you know, take, yeah, take some pills today, take some pills tomorrow. Um, uh, but so that that's important. And if she was going to undergo um, transplant or immunosuppression sure. from a high endemicity ende- area, something to consider. Right. Um, and uh, let's see if I had anything else. Um, no, the auto infection cycle. So I think this is is interesting. This this with what little we knew going into this, right. this could have well been a strongyloides case, right? And then the testing could have come back positive. That's right. And I think as multiple people are saying. Um, what about those three amoeba in the stool? Like maybe that was. Right. What was? What What are your thoughts about the? Well, three I was going to add to that, and I was going to say, why did we throw those in? Uh, and they were thrown in just for good luck, and they 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 are indicators. Okay, and what do they indicate? They indicate that the patient has been exposed to human feces as a contamination in their environment. There, that's the only way they're transmitted. So, so we now know that this patient encountered contamination of either food or water by human feces. And that's grounds enough to suspect that that's also how she acquired her salmonella. And so those were the tip-offs that, what if the culture had come back negative, which it did? And Mm -hmm. then that says, well, this woman is sick. She's suffering from these symptoms. And it seems to match good enough with a uh, an infection of the blood. And, and indeed, it, it turned out to be that. And so you could then run a screen for diagnosing the things that fit into that uh, kind of a scenario. And uh, and all of this can be explained by the data that was presented in the case. And, and you're right. I mean, um, instead of being salmonella, what if she was cured of salmonella and she was still sick? Then what would happen then is likely the uh, neutrophilia would go away mm-hmm. and the eosinophilia would return. And at that point, she would start to exhibit a 5 and 10 and then maybe a 15 or 20% eosinophilia mm-hmm. saying, hey, you guys missed something. There's something else going on here that you should have caught. And yeah, perhaps that yeah. could have been the, uh, the, uh, the stranger ladies. Yeah, and I think that's an interesting point. When a person has gram-negative bacteria, when they go into sepsis, the eosinophils are going to clear. 
Correct. Even if the strong glaze. So, so Could that's, you explain that a little bit more? Sure. Um, no, definitely. I think this is really important. I, I always ask about eosinophils, right? And people, you know, when exactly. I'm here at Columbia on the wards, right? That exactly. was like, ah, oh, it's not a, you know, it's not a parasite. What are you, right, right, <laughs> what are you asking? Right, right. But there's two issues with um, eosinophils. They can be elevated in certain um, parasitic infections. And right. we've talked about which those are, uh, particularly the inv- tissue invasive phase of helminth infections. So strongyloides, right, would be an example. Sure. Um, certain protozoans, which we like to have people memorize, right? That's true. Um, but in sepsis, when someone is severely ill, and this is actually related to the cortisol, you have a clearing of the eosinophils from the circulation. And as people get better, the eosinophil count starts to come back. Right. So it's actually been studied, and it's a very it's a negative prognostic uh, yeah, yeah, thing. Yeah. And in uh, malaria, we see right clearing of eosinophils is one of the things that makes us uh, worry huh. that in addition to the malaria infection, the person may also have a secondary bacterial infection, which maybe five ten percent of the time is the case. Sure. And, and then the other, I was hoping that you'd go back into the bone marrow to um, talk about the stem cells. I was, I was not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> because at some point, the body says it's more important to produce neutrophils to take care of the bacteria than it is to respond to an allergen produced by a parasite. That's, that's the point of decision that the stem cell makes in order to either go off and make a neutrophil or go off and make an eosinophil. And um, in in hyperinfection with trichinella, for instance, which can give you up to 70 to 80% eosinophilia, if you go beyond that level, mm-hmm. okay, and you have frank um, uh, breakdown of gut level um, protection, let's say you have a, a fraying of the gut tract, which trichinella can do as an adult, then you get bacteremia. And when the bacteremia occurs, the eosinophilia drops to zero and the neutrophil shift goes to the left and, mm-hmm. and you start fighting off those bacteria like crazy. So uh, this, this, this patient had a classic case of salmonella and uh, it, it – well, I, I'm just I'm, – I'm thrilled with the way this yeah, played no, out because good, all good. of the answers were good and they all had validity and uh, they were right on target. Yeah. So thank you for listening carefully. Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening. Indeed. <laughs> Are we going to do our hero? I think we're. I Let's see a hero. I see a hero. I see a hero. And I'm going to do these. Oh wait, hang on. Before we're done with this case, right? We are done. We have to pick a winner of the oh, book. So we should. So I'll we'll just let's wrap it up. Wrap it up. So we will say as our writers wrote in these three are are three of several. So here we talk about Entamoeba coli. And I have a little list here, a cheat sheet. Entamoeba hartmane, Entamoeba polecki, Endolimax nana, um, Iotamoeba boetschi. Butchlii. Did I, did I butchlii that? You butchered it. <laughs> you butchered the butchlii. <laughs> so so th- there's a, there are a number of amoeba right. um, that live in our, um, in our GI tract that are, um, the vast majority of time, if not all the time, um, commensals, non-pathogenic. Correct. Correct. There are, as we've discussed, a couple instances maybe where these can become pathogenic. Um, and um, so this is something, and, and actually it was, uh, I got a call on Friday. It was a busy day. I think I'd already seen like 32 patients. I was, uh, it was yeah. late. I was tired. I got a call from a colleague of mine who's now a, a cardiologist and it was uh, Dan. Can I can I ask you something? This isn't a consult. <laughs> this is a curbside. I've got a patient in clinic, and the stool O and P just came back with uh, <laughs> with Endolimax nanotrophozoites. Right. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so this this comes up. These results come up, sure. and um, it's important to have a sense of what to do because, as we saw, people might throw drugs at these, and then right. drugs have side effects, and and so and these don't go away with those drugs. Yeah, either. exactly. That's um, so yeah, so it's a it's a this is important information, and I just wanted to make sure that I threw out this case so people were aware. Right. Should they run into these, um, to know you know that one of the most important things is to not do anything sometimes. So yeah. stand there, D- do Dixon nothing. Dixon knows that very well, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh no, no. Dan, why was it like, not a consult? He would you would have to get paid. Is that the idea? No, this was you know I don't need you to come and see this patient. This oh, is just someone just in the office. Them, yeah. Can you give me you know? Can you help yeah. me understand? Yeah. What did you lab? say? 
Um, so I first I asked him. I said, "So you obviously don't listen to Twip, yeah? Because <laughs> <laughs> if you listen to Twip with over a million downloads, that's right. <laughs> we probably don't have any cardiologists listening. Ooh, that's we're a challenge. Get cardiologists because they love T. Cruz. They love that. Yeah, that's business. true. All right, any cardiologists listening, please write in. Let that's us right. let we us like know that. that you exist and listen. Um, but no, so, uh, no, and I think this happens a lot. Sometimes, Hey, can you see this patient help me figure it out? And sometimes it's, right. can you explain this to me? Mm. And, um, I'm very happy to do either. So, so you'd look for blood. And after cultures. seeing 32, I was very happy to explain. Over the phone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I mean, if I was the clinician at the other end, I'd say, Oh, that means it's been fecal contamination. So then I'm going to have to search for another cause for that. Yeah, no. And, and we asked, you know, are they having symptoms? What's right. going on? Why, exactly. did, why did you check? I checked because the patient said, please check. Yeah, right. Exactly. Well, right. Exactly. Right. All right. We had seven guesses. Right. So I put, the number seven into a random number generator. Go for it. What'd you get? Push the button. Generate a random number between one and seven. And? The number is four. The number four. The number is four. And that is Dan. Right. Who Way to go, Dan. Probably in Europe. And so it's going to cost <laughs> a lot of money to send it. But Dan, send us your address and telephone. And we will dispatch a book to you. Well, we need more than his uh, telephone. We need... Um... I said his address and telephone. Okay, fine. Did you not listen? We're good. You're right. I wasn't listening. I was busy. He was preparing to tell I us I was about multitasking. This. Actually, I think you, in fact, when I talk, you don't listen at all, do you? You, you keep saying that. <laughs> what did you say? I'm sorry. What did you say? Go ahead. Tell us the historical <laughs> shtick. I will do a spiel for you here. So this is a local hero, basically, um, and it's interesting that I should pick this first because it's all done alphabetically, obviously. But you didn't pick this person before because you've done a couple, right? That's right. Okay. But this this one is particularly relevant right now because of his um, influence on public health on the Isle of Puerto Rico, and Puerto oh, Rico is I know. undergoing oh, Lazier, right? Lazier. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's the student who died. This is Bailey K. Ashford. Bailey K. Ashford. Bailey K. Ashford. If you don't know the name and you've been to Puerto Rico and you've driven from the airport by cab to the inner city of San Juan, you will know Ashford Boulevard and you will pass Bailey K. Ashford House on the way, although you wouldn't know what you're looking at unless you knew this story. So Bailey K. Ashford identified hookworm infection as the main cause of, in quotes, Puerto Rico anemia that affected nearly 60% of the rural population. He instituted successful treatment and intervention programs, construction of latrines, wearing shoes, public health education, which significantly reduced the death rate from anemia due to this parasite. In 1925, Ashford helped to establish a school of public health in the city of Puerta de Tierra. His years of life were from 1873 to 1934. And he's one of the true heroes of the uh, the revolution of hygiene in the United States mm. and, and its outlying territories, of course. And um, he took the Hookworm Commission's recommendations and applied them to the people living in Puerto Rico. And uh, they worked beautifully because they were spot on in terms of how to control that infection. And along with Hookworm, a lot of other things disappeared. Your favorite organism, polio, probably went down in prevalence as well because the stools were sequestered in outhouses and not allowed to go into the the rivers and contaminate water and things yes, like that. Yes, but their fingers were still dirty. Their fingers and they were, were still dirty. And they had polio virus on them. They would go back in the home and spread it. They did. So, so it wasn't as well controlled as hookworm, I agree. But uh, I'm sure that the, the, the um, other... Infections went down as the result of uh, a more countrywide awareness of the need to control fecal contamination. Certainly at the turn of the 20th century when sanitation got better in the U.S., that yeah. that decreased the, the amount of polio infection in early life anyway. Right. But it just delayed it, in fact, because right. eventually you going to get fecal contamination at some point in your life. Here's an interesting question for you, Dr. Racaniello, expert on poliovirus. Going back in the history of the United States, were there epidemics that could now be explained by polio that were not explained then, that started at the Revolutionary War period, let's say? No, epidemics of paralysis. There were there are sporadic cases here and there, for sure. Okay. We recognized them as polio. We didn't know what caused them because the virus wasn't isolated until 1906. 
But at, after the turn of the 20th century, we, we started to see epidemics for the first time. The first epidemic was in Vermont, actually. There's a memorial up there to it. Interesting. And then they got bigger and bigger and bigger. Huh. Now you may ask, why did the okay. epidemiology change? And I always tell my students, if this happened today, <laughs> someone would say, oh, the virus mutated. <laughs> because that's the simplest thing they can think of. And it takes just a little bit more thinking <laughs> to realize that if you delay infection, you can also change the epidemiology so the virus doesn't have to mutate. You know, back then we couldn't sequence genomes, so we didn't use that as an excuse. Mm -hmm. What happened was in pre-1900, most babies were infected in the first year of life because the sanitation was so poor. And in that time, they had protective maternal antibodies from their mother. So they were protected, then they developed immunity. Got it. Okay, so then let's delay infection to the second, third, fourth, fifth year of life. Right. What do you think happened? They don't have yeah. maternal immunity, right? That's right. Boom. That's so right. now you have big cohorts of kids at that age, and boom, you introduce virus, you get an outbreak. So that completely explains the shift in epidemiology. So this is a perfect example of why everything should not be done in moderation. <laughs> you either want no feces or tons of it. <laughs> right. No, that's probably <laughs> and it right. was the moderation. It was the moderation of the Victorian era that uh, caused all these problems. Yeah, that's right. The increased sanitation, improved yeah. sanitation, delayed infection. That's yeah. absolutely right. But, uh, sooner or later, you're going to pick up a mint in a restaurant and you're going to get fecally contaminated mint because people come out of the bathroom, they don't wash their hands, they have a thin layer of feces on their fingers. Right, Dixon? Just like the world is covered. You got it. All right. I... I, I Sorry, I went on a bit. It's okay. No, that was good. That was very good. <laughs> no, that's good stuff. That was excellent. Before we go on, you're finished, right, Dixon? I'm done. Thank you. Uh, I would like to tell you that this episode is brought to you by Blue Apron. Last time I said it was the last Blue Apron ad, and then the ad agency wrote and said, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Come there's, back. There's one more on Twip and one more on Twiv. How about So that? I made a mistake. I'm not good at keeping these records. Yeah, but this uh, will be the last one on TWIP, and um, we're grateful for all their support, which has led to us eating very well. This episode is brought to you by Blue Apron, the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. Blue Apron's mission is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone while supporting a more sustainable food system, setting the highest standards for ingredients, and building a community of home chefs. For less than $10 per person per meal, Blue Apron delivers seasonal recipes along with pre-portioned ingredients to make delicious home-cooked meals in 45 minutes or less. There's no weekly commitment, so you only get deliveries when you want them. Every ingredient in your delivery arrives fresh and ready to cook, or they'll make it right. And the menu changes every week based on what's in season and is designed by Blue Apron's in-house culinary team. For November, here are some of Blue Apron's recipes. Seared steaks and garlic butter with oven fries and romaine salad. Butternut squash pasta with kale and brown butter walnuts. Barramundi and mixed mushrooms with jasmine rice and Napa cabbage. Roasted chicken and full vegetables with cranberry and ginger compote. Now, I like eating... Not a big fan of cooking, but I love cooking with Blue Apron because I don't have to shop, which is the part I don't like. I just hate finding everything, finding a recipe. Blue Apron, you get a box, you open it, and you start cooking. This is fantastic for a person like me. I don't have to shop. I know Dixon loves shopping. I do. I used to drop you off and you'd run into the A&P. This is true. Ugh. Oh. Especially at night. Oh, hate it's fine. It. Yeah. So Blue Apron is made but for somebody Dick, like Dixon me. can never go more than 45 minutes without having to run in somewhere and uh, A&P. You think? <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I thought that was a joke. <laughs> oh, I did a TWIV in, in, at Indiana University a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, I asked my guests, if you hadn't been a scientist, what would you do? And one of them said, I'd be a chef. And I said, well, check out Blue Apron. That's right. <laughs> the whole audience laughed <laughs> <laughs> because they know they are a sponsor. It's all in the box. Pre-portioned ingredients, everything you need is right there. For me, what could be better? I love it. I really enjoy it. Plus, it's delicious. If it were up to me, 
I do Blue Apron for Thanksgiving, but uh, that might be pushing it. But I tell you, if you're busy or if you're not a big fan of cooking, it's great. Now, my my kids are our kids are all older and out of the house, but if they were still around, I would get Blue Apron and say, "Hey, let's do this." Because did you know that cooking together builds strong family bonds? And get this, research shows that Blue Apron families cook nearly three times more often. So I would definitely get my kids into cooking. And who knows, using Blue Apron, and who knows, maybe they would then go on to really like cooking the rest of their lives. Blue Apron is treating This Week in Parasitism listeners to their first dinner, a $30 value with $30 off your first delivery and free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash TWIP. So check out this week's menu. Get $30 off your first delivery with free shipping at blueapron.com slash TWIP. Today, Blue Apron, a better way to cook. So you know what I've been doing with, <laughs> with Blue Apron, as you cough towards me again, I is um, I lay all the ingredients oh, out. Like initially when I started doing Blue Apron, I would follow step by step. Now I lay it all out and I just sort of make my up. creativity go. Oh, all right. Well, that's an and, interesting uh, thing And it's to do. it's fun because you've got all these things, all these supplies, and you can kind of modify them a little, maybe throw a little of your own stuff in. And got it. Do you ever have anything left over? Um, we always we always do have a little bit left over, not a yeah. lot because yeah. well, if all the if everyone's home for dinner, that's a problem with teenagers. Like one's off at play practice, one's playing soccer. Um, so when they're all there, then everything's gone. But if there's a little <laughs> left over, then I do something. You know, it reminds me of I take something apart to fix it, <laughs> put it back together. Parts. Wait, what's that part? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> what's that extra yeah. screw? That's right. Don't do that with your car. No. All right, we have a, a paper. We do. Dixon, this is published in Nature Microbiology. And it it's is. about trypanosomes. Yes. Does that mean that trypanosomes are microbes? Oh, they're microscopic. But are they microbes? It depends on how you define that I guess term. that's a pedantic question, right? They're eukaryotic microbes. Yeah, it's still a microbe, right? Yeah. As long as you use the microscope to see them, I think they're microbes. There microbial. used to be a journal called Eukaryotic Microbiology. Yeah, there used to be. That's a clumsy title, though, right? Yeah, that's it's too bad. Okay, so this is perfectly acceptable to have this paper, which is called APOLs with Low pH Dependence Can Kill All African Trypanosomes. Seems like a rather broad case, but we'll see. Nature Microbiology, first author, Frédéric Fontaine. Yep. And the last author is Etienne Pei. Uh, now this is all about apolipoproteins. Right. Should we should we explain what those are? We we've yeah. already talked about what a microbe is. Oh great! I'm glad you knocked <laughs> already... that topic off while I was out. No, no, no you, you were, were, you were here. here. You were, I was out. Okay. You just weren't listening, and Vincent was talking. I see. <laughs> Sorry, Dixon. I just kicked your leg. Daniel, since no, you're the doc, anything. tell us what an apolipoprotein. I was I was thinking that was science, right? Apolipoprotein. Yeah, okay. Well, no, it's, it's okay. They're, they're, <laughs> they're, <laughs> so, they're, they're proteins that bind lipids. Um, right. I don't want to have people think that science and medicine are two. Yeah, specific. you just did. <laughs> did I do that? <laughs> um, no, no, I'm not a scientist. I just use science every day, right? To uh, exactly. well, you do yeah. some research. You have a lab yeah. here, right? It's a That's tool. true. No, yeah. you're a good scientist. In um, no, so the, so apolipoproteins, they're really interesting, and I think people may initially say, what are those? But then they'll quickly say, oh, I'm familiar with those. I use them all the time. And so the apolipoproteins, these are proteins that bind lipids. Mm -hmm. So you end up with this, um, this complex, which at one end is hydrophobic and the other end is hydrophilic, right? So this is pretty cool stuff. So what ends up happening is they're going to orient in such a way that the hydrophilic or charged end is going to be able to dissolve in water, and the hydrophobic, so fear of water, is going to be the other way. And so you're going to these either can form little um, small globules, so to say, or they can actually um, insert in membranes. Right. With one, the hydrophobic being inside, and the hydrophilic being outside, so they can dissolve. And um, people have probably heard of um, the apo um, lipoproteins in cholesterol metabolism, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so you have different types of apolipoproteins in the bad and the good cholesterol. <clears throat> so this is involved in uh, cholesterol transport, yep. atherosclerosis. Um, so this is this is important stuff. And uh, as we'll we'll get forward, we'll sort of talk a little bit about um, where these localize in cells and how what they're talking about can and sure. can't. What are the limitations and challenges with therapeutics?
So there's a common substance that we use every day that mimics what you just said. It's got a hydrophobic end and a hydrophilic end. Soap. Thank you. Carbon. Yes. See? So if people don't know what that means, yeah. just think of how soap works. And it dissolves water solubles at one end and it dissolves lipid solubles at the other and binds them together and away they go. So I and, guess the whole point here is soap kills sleeping sickness. Exactly, exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> so what's it's interesting why we use here, it. <laughs> there, are six, there are six of these uh, genes in humans, ApoL1 through 6. And uh, a number of years ago, it was found that ApoL1 is trypanolytic. Yeah, I knew the person who did that work, by the way. Who's that? Mickey Rifkin. She worked uh, at Rockefeller University. How, how well did you know her? Very well. We were in the same study section together. She'd be married to George Cross, right? For a while. All right, so um, interestingly, there's a, a woman at Hunter, Jane Raper. Right. Who, now one of the problems is that um, cow, you can't easily grow cows in in parts of Africa, right, because of trypanosomes, exactly. right? Exactly. And she wants to make transgenic cows with an ApoL1 that will prevent Smart. them from being infected. Not easy. Mm -hmm. You want to basically replace all the cows in Africa with transgenic cows. I like the approach here, and we'll talk about it in this paper. Yeah. Now, yeah. not too many years ago, we found that ApoL6 inhibits poliovirus infection. Yeah. Mm. Now, the person who did that left, and we have never followed up. But reading this paper, I have new ideas about how to Look maybe out. maybe some of the same mechanisms as we'll see. But I don't have anyone to do the work oh. anymore, so I can't pursue it because I have a lab of one, <laughs> and soon it will probably be zero. <laughs> Why am I laughing? <laughs> <laughs> Why are we laughing? Crying, but no, no, I'm not crying because I've had a long career, and now we I have wow. a second career. You know what? You just gave that idea to somebody out there, and they're going to try it. Let them do it. All right. So ApoL1 was previously shown to be trypanolytic. Yes. It triggers when you add it. This is a secreted protein that uh, you add it to the parasite. It triggers apot apototic-like death. Uh, and it, what it does, it makes pores in the endosome and in the mitochondrial membranes, and it requires low pH. So it has to go through an acidic endosomal compartment. The protein inserts into a membrane, and then it kills the trypanosome. And we talked about that on TWIP. We did. Number 85, the name of that episode was Channeling Trips. Pretty cool, huh? Okay. I showed this paper to my wife, Doris, this morning, who used to work on trips. And she said, oh, Jane will be upset. <laughs> 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 Jane, who's making the transgenic cows. Indeed. Right? Indeed. Now, but I don't think the transgenic cow is the is as bad as you suggest, right? Because they don't have to replace all the cows. There are areas where the cows can't go, right? That are limited. So you, all you do is you introduce, and then the cows can go in those areas. Maybe and not get there is a problem with that, however. I want to hear this is all being done in Africa, and where the cows yeah. can't go, the game can. <laughs> yeah. So now you've yeah. got a conflict. <laughs> You've got a conflict between the gnus and the wildebeests. Yeah, now suddenly you have cows cow. moving into the national parks. So, hey, Dixon, what's, is that a good idea or a bad idea? What's Nagana? Nagana is the old term for this. Cow it's cow, cow yeah, infection. It's cow infection. T. brucei, T. B. brucei. That's right. That's right. Yeah. T. congolensi and T. Yeah. vivac. And who discovered it? Uh, Bruce. And we will do him next because... Uh, Bruce. Because B comes after A. Bailey. And then... Yeah. B -R -U -C. Why do they call one Vivax to confuse us with another? I have no idea. <laughs> Plasmodium Vivax, right? Vivax means lively, that's all. Oh, you should adopt that name. You yes. think? Yeah. You're lively. Just it was lively. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right, so um, ApoL1. Now, the, the interesting he thing here is that ApoL1 cannot kill TB gambiensi and TB roden rhodesiensi. Right, rhodesiensi. Rhodesiensi. Named after Rhodesia. <laughs> Which doesn't Remember, we're going to rename that. We're going to call it Zimbabwe. That's Zimbabwe. right. Zimbabwe. We should call it TB Zimbabwe. TB Zimbabwe. That's right. Yeah. And then TB Gambia. It was named after okay. Rhodes. Rhodes, who was the uh, the colonial leader down there in South Africa. Hmm. Now, here's a really cool part of this. Daniel, you'll like this. In Africa, um, Amino acid substitutions in the C-terminus of ApoL1 have been selected in people. 
Mm-hmm. Makes sense. That's an important yeah. part for protection. Sure. Right? They confer resistance to rhodesiense. Yeah. But these are also associated with kidney disease. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? That is interesting. Uh, so do you know, uh, can you give me another example of a protective allele that's associated with a disease? Well, I think the obvious people probably think about is sickle cell. Yeah, right. right. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the one. So you got to pay the but price. But the thalassemias right? also, there's a, there's a lot of hemoglobinopathies, G6PD deficiencies. Uh, um, so true. there's been a lot of, uh, sure. there's been a lot of prices paid to survive right. um, these right. parasitic onslaughts. Correct. Now, here's the other cool thing. So many trypanosomes are resistant to ApoL1 because mm-hmm. it's, it's secreted from cells. Other APOs are not secreted. So they think, well, if the trips have never seen them because they're not secreted, maybe they haven't evolved resistance. Uh-huh. So let's check some of these intracellular APOLs and see mm-hmm. if they can inhibit trypanolytic activity. Okay. And so that's what they did uh, in, these, in this paper. They did a series of killing assays. Killing assays, Dixon. I hear you. All right, with different recombinant. And, when and they where find, did they get these from? Uh, from Papio Papio. Well, so one of them is from Papio Papio. <laughs> what is Papio Papio? Uh, I don't know. Tell uh, me what it it's is. It's a baboon. It's a baboon. All right. It's a baboon. Papio Papio. That's its name. I, I don't like species in genera, but they have genera species the same. <laughs> That's right. You know another one? Canis you know, Canis. Is there a Canis Canis? How about Loa Loa? Loa Loa. <laughs> It's ridiculous. Couldn't you think of another name? All right. So they tried, they cloned them out of these various species. Um, Not only human, but yes, Papio. And they they assay for killing. And what they find is that um, APOL3 is trypanolytic on Brucey. Right. Okay. They also kills Rhodesiense, Gambiense, Evansi, Congolense, and Vivax. But it doesn't kill. More related Distantly related ones like, and these I never heard of, Dixon. So you right. could laugh now and, and say, oh, you don't know anything. Uh, no, I'm not going to say anything. T. Tyler I. Yeah. T. Lewis I and T. Musculi. It sounds like a mouse one, doesn't it? Musculi. Yeah. Now, Tyler, does that discovered by Max Tyler? Probably. <laughs> but he Maybe. worked on yellow fever. Nobody could have also discovered that. Too. So what do they infect? Lewis I, a rat? Rats. In fact, what does Tyler I infect? A cattle, I think. So, so uh, ApoL3 doesn't kill those, okay? Or T. cruzi. But the Papio, or T. cruzi, but Papio, ApoL1, killed Rodensiense, but not Gambiense. So, this is an example of a paper where you take yeah. APOs from different species, different APOs and from different species, and you, you can learn something from exactly. what they kill. I thought this was interesting, actually, the cruzi, because maybe our, maybe our listeners are aware of the very different nature of the different trypanosomes, and uh, I'll be the uh, the listener asking questions of Dixon. But this, some are <laughs> intracellular, some are extracellular. Some are. What, what's the story? Would that okay. would that play into this at all? Why it certain would. intracellular ones might have become resistant, and extracellular sure. ones wouldn't have seen? What what's the story sure. here? So, if you go back 175 million years ago, when the continents oh, of my gosh. Africa, well, <laughs> when the continents of Africa and South America were connected then there probably was just one trypanosome species for the entire supercontinent. Mm. But when it drifted apart, the trypanosomes began to speciate. And so the ones in Africa that we find there today are extracellular parasites. They do not live inside cells at all. And the one in South America, trypanosoma cruzi, lives both in the bloodstream and intracellular. And if it lives intracellular, it lives as an amastico. It, it, it actually... Uh, encloses the flagellum inside the uh, the organism and it looks like a tri- it, lo- it looks like a Lishmania parasite at that yeah. point. So a mastigo without a mast. Without exactly a right. But yeah. but very often as it as it eats its way through the tissue, it differentiates back into the triple mastigo to, so that the reduvid bug can pick it up from the bloodstream. Mm-hmm. Okay, now they do a, a number of very nice experiments which I don't really want to get into, but they find that APOL one and APOL3 seem to kill by different mechanisms. Mm-hmm. And in the end, what it turns out is that APOL3 doesn't require acidification huh. to kill. Mm-hmm. It has a different mechanism. And they think that this difference between one and three has to do with free glutamic acid residues uh, in the protein. 
and these are, of course, negatively charged amino acids. They think that these might inhibit, hinder membrane insertion at neutral pH, um, and their protonation at low pH is triggered is needed to trigger transmembrane insertion for ApoL1. Interesting. So ApoL3 doesn't have these. So what do you think they did? They tried to remove them and they then swapped see what them into from one into three. They put three glutamic okay. acids into three, and, and now it either. becomes it becomes. Wait a minute. Is that what they did? <laughs> uh, so they did in silico. Okay, in this variant, ApoL3, uh, ApoL3. Yeah, it, then uh, that thing, they made ApoL3 with the three glutamic acids from ApoL1, and it's no longer active at neutral pH. Exactly. It now requires acidic pH. Thank Isn't that cool? You. Yep. So uh, n- this explains sort of why you need acidic pH, because yeah. it depends on these three amino acids. Right. Um they also did some experiments uh, where they injected these proteins into mice to see if it would actually protect them. Because so far we're looking at trypanolytic activity in culture, right? Mm-hmm. And you got to stick it in mice. It turns out that ApoL3 kills the mice. <laughs> so they say this shows that the protein cannot be considered for treatment of infection. <laughs> no, <Evo. laughs> not really. <laughs> and so it's such an understatement, right? Yes. Of course not. That's- you probably wouldn't even have to say that. <laughs> All the mice died. It's clearly toxic. Exactly. Okay, but ApoL1 is not toxic, and of no. course. But the ApoL1, the problem is it doesn't kill enough trypanosomes of different sorts, right? Yeah. And the Papio1 uh, seems to be the best. It's not inactivated um, and so forth. And so they say, um, could we uh, change, um, what is it, Papio to kill even more <laughs> trypanosomes? Uh, and they think that um, they're again they they take these three ApoL1 specific glutamic acid residues from ApoL1. They just put one, um, the last glutamic acid of Papio Helix Nine. They they substitute it with the ApoL3 uh, amino acid. A single substitution. It increases the ability of the Papio ApoL1 to kill. E. coli at neutral pH and allowed more efficient killing activity of different strains of all the different strains of Gambiense. Yep. That they, so those are all African strains, right? Yes. The other ones we talked about, are they not necessarily African? Um, most of those are too, but some of them are not. Well, Kruzai would be your classic. So Kruzai, right. no. New, T. New T. Lewis, world, I were asking yeah. about so T. Lewis. The, the statement that this, <laughs> this, so it's a novel APO, which they've made by taking... Yes papio and substituting a glutamic acid residue in it says it kills all african trypanosomes so that's a correct statement Mm -hmm. right because all the different gambienses okay so the idea is that apol3 can um has has a different killing profile right and apol1 from apol1 apol1 has this uh glutamic acid residues. So all they do is take one of those glutamic acids and put it in papio ApoL1 and it, this, the killing is extended. Yeah. I think it's brilliant yeah. that they were able to do this. And I think they also show that 100 micrograms are enough to protect mice from killing. Um, so this is a beautiful sh- example <coughs> of how you can look at different versions of a protein and swap amino acids to come up with something that is now broadly effective as an anti-trypanolytic that doesn't exist in nature. But I guess the challenge is how do we deal with this toxicity? Can we deal with this toxicity? Well, Papio isn't toxic. Yeah. Right? So they started with Papio. Mm-hmm. I'm going to have to go outside. Goodbye. You want to say anything about this paper? It's a fantastic paper. I picked it. <laughs> would you? Uh, Who picked this paper? I did. Would you like? It's, it's okay. Paper. You could take claim. No, no. I love. I love this paper <laughs> also because there's a figure in this paper that I had. I didn't even know what the technique was. Oh, tell us about that. FIBS SEM tomography, it's right? Focused imaging beam s- scanning electron microscopy, and they focus this beam of protons. I think it is onto the stage where the specimen is, and they use a scanning EM. There's a special microscope that's been invented just to accommodate this uh, combination of techniques and you get a three-dimensional it's beautiful picture of yeah. this is fabulous of imaging. a single trypanosome right it's an amazing 
imaging technology. You can see the kinetoplast. Everything. You can see the mitochondrion, the fenestrated mitochondrion, exactly. which of course is being fenestrated by the APOL protein. Exactly. Nucleus nucleolus. It's beautiful. I went to the internet and looked up a whole bunch of other images. It's well, just fabulous. You can see what the APOL3 is doing. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So I was fascinated. Now, by that. Um, Daniel, what do you think about the therapeutic potential of this novel APOL, Papio APOL1 derived protein? You know, they they like to do that now is where you're supposed to wrap up with your, you know, like, okay, now that we know this, <laughs> yeah, exactly. that's right. we have exactly. wonderful therapy. No, but I think this is a is a basic science advance at this point. Um, we saw the issue with toxicity. Is there a way to somehow take this knowledge that we now have mm. and start thinking of future experiments where somehow we can maintain killing or modify the um, papio to get the killing we want, but without the toxicity, yeah. I, I think we're not quite there. I mean, it's a great paper. It's interesting. It's nice to say, boy, at some point in history, maybe these did, um, APOL1 maybe had killing ability, but there's mutations that have gotten around that. Cruz, I probably saw this and has already mutated away, so it doesn't have to worry because it is intracellular. Yeah, right. sure. um, but I think we're not quite there yet. Now, somebody's got to say, maybe we could better understand how this is doing the killing, yeah. and then maybe understand the toxicity. And if they're different, um, and I think they are actually, I get a sense just by um, the Papio example, that maybe they're different and you can create a molecule that retains the killing but does not have the toxicity. So APOL1 is normally in the serum of humans, so that's why it's less toxic. APOL3 is normally intracellular, so when you inject it into serum, boom, the mm -hmm. mice die. So they're exactly. not used to having it there. So um, they say, you know, it's a promising prospect for treating sleeping sickness. Mm -hmm. Although I don't know, you know, giving a protein is always a dicey proposition, right? Uh, it is also when you're looking at where you're trying to treat. Um, you know, these are in resource limited parts of the world where we still have this issue. Yeah, you'd have to inject this, right? Yeah, you'd have to deal with everything associated with, um, you know, keeping this protein. I guess you could desiccate it, but um, still there's a lot of challenges. And then, there. of course, if you overuse it, you're going to get, you're going to select for resistance. So that's, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's a question of how quickly could they get, you know, because it may have been, as Dixon was saying, 175 million years ago, you yeah. know, this, and then there may, it may have taken a really long time. So if you can come in quickly and rid an area of these diseases, then, you know, maybe it won't have the time to yeah. mutate. So that would be the hope. Uh, but no, it's a great, interesting paper, but this isn't really, I think it got sort of the splash in the headlines of, you know, you know, yeah, you know yeah. a cure for all forms of trypanosomiasis. I don't think we have a cure yet. Um, oh, no, 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 we don't have a cure. As you say, it's an interesting scientific advance, but uh, therapeutically, it's we have to do a lot more work. All right. Now that brings us to the time in TWIP when Daniel digs into his mail bag or his case bag. You have a case bag and pulls out a new case? You know, I'm in the electronic age, so I have a file. <laughs> I have a file with a uh, bunch of cases. And I actually, um, I can already predict the future. I've already laid out um, mm. the next half dozen or so. I, tr I try to be prepared ahead of time. You never know what's going to happen. <laughs> uh, but I have a case if people are ready. Very good. All right, here we go. This is a woman in her 50s who is an immigrant from a rural area with limited resources. So I like that, that gives you sort of a broad, <laughs> um, and, and yeah, I do that for a reason. Um, you don't necessarily need to know where she is coming from at this point, but we'll just say a rural area with limited resources. Uh, she ends up being admitted to the hospital um, with iron deficient anemia and eosinophilia. Now, this is an admission to a hospital in the United States. And what do we do when a woman is over the age of 50 and has anemia? They send her for her colonoscopy. She hasn't had her colonoscopy. And when they do the colonoscopy, hmm. they note a long, slender, serpiginous, motile object, and they recover it. And this is about four and a half centimeters in length, one end is very slender while the other end is large and curled, but not blunt. And they send off this, um, mm. I'm going to call it a worm. They send off this worm to the parasitology lab for identification. And uh, so I'm going to ask people some questions. That's all you're going to get. Mm -hmm. um, 
what might fit this description? What, what parasite do we know? You guys can page through your electronic or hard copy versions. Um, next question, is this parasite usually associated with eosinophilia, right? Because we have eosinophilia here. Um, what about the anemia? I'm going to suggest there might be a link. And if there is, is this going to be severe or mild anemia? And then, this is number four, would this person have to have come from outside the U.S. to acquire this infection? So this area with limited resources, do they have to have been an immigrant, as we describe her, or could they have come from just a rural area within the United States? Hmm. And I think we're going to give away a book again. Yeah, we are. Random we are. Random uh, picking. Do you, do you have to get it right, or do you just have to email in with some guests? And no, then you we just... Pick, uh, yeah. We said last time we, we could say well, you have to get it right, and if there's more than one, we can randomly pick next time. We could just mix it up. You want it to be that? I think it should be participation. Book. People people write in, and they, they give Do it participation. Their, their effort. Yeah, participation, and then we'll do a random selection. Single word answers will not be counted. <laughs> yeah, it's got to actually be a... <laughs> you have to actually give an explanation yeah, for yeah, your diagnosis. Yeah, wink, you can't just write one word. No, that's right. <laughs> wink. He's done that every so often. <laughs> but this, it's right. And this is going to be a hard cover copy, which will be autographed by uh, you and Daniel, right? Yeah. So do you have a copy here today that you have both signed? We have a copy right in take, front of take us. Take mine and sign it, and I no, will I have, mail it. have plenty of copies. We should, we'll sign a few. We'll have a few kind of in, in waiting in the dock. That's a perfect Here's a idea. question. Would anyone come to a TWIP uh, in person here in New York City, let's say, where Daniel and Dixon signed and gave away copies of the book? <sighs> Sometimes we should do like a performance where all yeah. three of us get together and invite a, what do they call those, studio audiences? We do. Yeah. Yeah. We call them studio audiences. Yeah. yeah. Except right. then it would be like those videos where I actually have to like, I can't look off the <laughs> ceiling. I'm like, reach off and drink my coffee. I have to, right. you know. That's right. We do have a few uh, <laughs> emails. You missed the case. It's over. I know. Is it okay? It's okay. I already know what it was. No, that's not true. <laughs> No, I can read it. He's going to give it to you. Let me read uh, some email. So Alan from Hawaii sends an article on drug combination targeting Wolbachia may really reduce treatment times of lymphatic filariasis and onchocerciasis. So this is uh, in the medical press. New combination therapy of registered drugs dramatically shortens therapy for some parasitic diseases. Uh, so they target w Wolbachia. Daniel, the yes. drugs is are symbionts which are required for the parasites to be fit. Is that correct? You know, you and I, when we when I was recording those lectures yeah. earlier, do you remember which um, does not have a Wolbachia? Which Filaria does not have a Wolbachia? Like Loa Loa. Oh, Baskin Vincent. I'm sorry, Vincent. I didn't you could that. go with that. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so no, no. So onchocerciasis, all the lymphatic filariasis, they all have these Wolbachia symbionts, yeah, they yeah. and they're actually they are symbionts. They actually are required. So when you kill the Wolbachia, um, you can um, yeah, hopefully in the combination mm. therapy shorten the treatment courses. So this was a PNAS paper. Albendazole and antibiotics synergize to deliver short course anti Wolbachia curative treatments in preclinical models of filariasis. No, yeah. is. A preclinical model is some kind of animal model, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's a PNAS paper, Dixon. It's a PNAS paper. Does that mean it's good? Uh, usually. I like to think there's two types of PNAS papers. <laughs> no, I, honestly. Tell us. Um, one is um, someone's a member and they, they submit it. The other is sort of through a peer review process. And right. I have to admit, I, I often ask people that. This, um, this, like, uh, was this submitted by a member or did this go through the peer review process? Uh, uh, it's submitted by a member. Yeah. Uh -huh. And it was reviewed by John Horton and Patrick Lamy. They uh, what, actually put the reviewer names. Uh, great. Yeah. What, what member was it that uh, wrote the article? Janet Hemingway. Huh. And where is she located? She is located at the Liverpool School of Tropical cool. Medicine. How interesting. Which is in... Liverpool. <laughs> in what country? England. Bet. No, it's actually a major place. This goes back to the history, right? right. When the London School and Liverpool were getting set that up, was it was sort of a rivalry. Maybe we'll talk about that at some exactly. point. But no, I don't want to discount... It's also I mean, the birthplace of the Beatles. Really? Yeah, that's where they're from. 
Oh, the Beatles, the rock band. I thought we were talking about ectoparasitology. <laughs> no, there no, all of a no, the carpet Beatles uh, in this case. No, but I don't want to. I don't want to belittle any any PNAS um, submissions now because there's excellent papers that have been submitted. No, there's but just in my mind, there's a certain you, you don't know until you know. Yeah, that's true. Yep, so. for sure. All right, uh, Daniel, can you read Peter's, please? Peter writes, "Dear Twip Team, I would like to bring your attention uh, to an interesting item about African trypanosomiasis." Wow. I heard on the BBC Radio 5 Live Science Podcast of 5 November 2017, that's Guy Fox Day, remember remember the 5th of November, yeah. the host talk by <laughs> Dr. Annette McLeod of the University of Glasgow, who explains how African trypanosomiasis can exist for years as a largely asymptomatic skin infection with the parasites undetectable by blood smears. Such asymptomatic individuals can act as a human reservoir for the disease, hindering its elimination. Working with Professor Duncan Graham of the University of Strathclyde, they are developing a non, a handheld, non-invasive diagnostic tool able to detect the right. trypanosomes in the skin using laser Raman spectroscopy. Mm. That's and really amazing. put a little um, link to the program there. Yeah. And the program details do not provide links to any research papers, um, but then we go ahead and get some more links below. So is this tell tell us about this skin asymptomatic skin and you can't find the parasite in blood smears is that all correct? You don't know. Do you know? Do you know Dixon? Nope. That's uh, it's something new to you. It is actually. How about you, Daniel? No, I've actually heard this described. And this is this is always these concerns. Is you you think oh I'm going to diagnose these people and we talked about how you're going to do blood smears in our in our yeah, videos yeah. Um, which we recorded some today um, and this is what you worry about right and I, I'm trying to think of what would be the other great examples of where the person has um, like the leishmaniasis manifestation right where you have the mm -hmm. the the skin manifestations post dermal leishmanoid yeah, yeah. that's right post uh, post cala is a you, dermal you, leishmaniasis you give them PKD. enough drug to drive them into the skin and then they develop these polyps that are just absolutely disfiguring and just awful to look at and curable if you give enough drug but, but they can be super spreaders so you always worry about with yeah. um, every disease that you may be treat let's say you treat 99 percent, but that one percent that you're missing is part of the um, exactly. continuation exactly. Um, and that's a problem and as we were talking a little bit earlier while you were you were out coughing or something i was, Dixon, I was out coughing you're out definitely. coughing yes um definitely. was you know because we were saying oh what if we get this new modality in our paper up to treatment and then this, the trypanosomes mutate. But we're saying if you could treat and really clear, you know, everything, this, you know, everything then yeah. it doesn't have time to mutate. But if you've got a few of these people that you don't even realize are infected uh, out right. there continuing the cycle, you, you're you're in trouble. Okay. That's true. That is true. You don't want to read the next letter? I can't because my classes are in the next room. You go ahead. Okay, I'll, Your I can, glasses. Yeah, I thought I you said your classes. No, when I left to cough, I left my classes outside. I'm sorry. That's okay. Do you want to read it there from Anthony? I will, and then you can read the last one. How's right, that? That'll work. Perfect. Anthony writes, he sends a link to an article by Bill Gates on mass drug administration. Quote, the village I visited was participating in what's known as a mass drug administration campaign, which seeks to treat everyone against the disease, even if they are not actually infected or show any symptoms. Typically, of course, the sick are the ones who get treated not the people who are healthy. But when it comes to combating some diseases like lymphatic filariasis, it's critical for health workers to try to treat the entire at-risk population yeah. to break the cycle of transmission. If not, the disease could continue to be spread by those who are not aware they are infected. Right. Of course. However, and Daniel, you tell me, mm -hmm. it's not always a good idea to give drugs to healthy people, is it? It is not always a good idea, but it's a risk. It's a risk benefit, um, and some of these areas where these diseases are there, the only um, the only current approach that seems to be working are these mass drug yeah. Uh, yeah. programs. So the alternative is to get filariasis, which is not good. So no. yeah, all right. And he also sends a link, an Amazon link, where you can purchase for twenty dollars a vintage right. photo portrait of Cyril Garnum. Correct. And he, Anthony writes, while doing my regular search on Amazon to see if some interesting titles might be available, I came across this listing. I do have to wonder what the market is for this item. <laughs> 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 Who is Cyril Garnum? We'll get to that. He's in the book. Oh, good. Would you buy a picture of him? He, no, but I didn't have to. You He's in go, the book. You can get all of the pictures you want from the Welcome Trust. You could get all the pictures you want from Alice's Restaurant. <laughs> 
this is also true, but it's actually, the pictures we used in the book you know, are from goes, London. It goes a different way. Welcome. You can get anything you want at no, Alice's song, Restaurant. And who sang that song? Uh, Arlo Guthrie. Thank you. Son of? Woody Guthrie. Who was famous for? Pete Seeger. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> what was he famous for? Yeah, you hung out with Pete Seeger. And people so like they used to sail a boat up and down the Hudson. Yeah. Was that Pete Seeger? Or yeah. Woody Guthrie. That was Pete Seeger. I Woody, still see the boat. Woody that, Guthrie died a long time ago. And Arlo lived in Brooklyn. He's a local kid. That's oh, yeah. Right. And what did Woody Guthrie die from? I don't know. Lou Gehrig's disease. Yeah, ALS? Yeah. Hmm. So Arlo was afraid he would die from that, too. And I'm not sure if he did or not. Yes. Well, so, Anthony, there is a portrait of Cyril in the book. So Correct. And we will get to reading Okay, this. good. Excellent. You will find out exactly who this now, man was. There's the last email. Take that, uh, Daniel. Uh, wait, it's just in short, though. Garnham was responsible for the experiments that led to the discovery of the hypnozoid. He was a malariologist that worked at the London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. Can I buy a picture of you on Amazon? It'll cost you more than 20 bucks. <laughs> well, an- well, Daniel's reading the letter. I'm going to search for a photo of you on Amazon oh, don't do that, that I could don't buy. Do don't do that. Okay. No, you shouldn't do that. Okay. And I will, you know, I'm a big Arlo Guthrie fan. I'll just say before I continue on. And I believe he's moved to Massachusetts, but I believe he's still alive. Good. But I'm not like a close friend of his. So if he died, I would not necessarily know till after the fact. No, I loved his sense of humor (laughs) and his uh, sense of history. He had a good sense of history as well. I've been to very few concerts in my life. And one of them was an Arlo Guthrie concert. I actually sat outside. I did not actually have tickets to go in. Well, I had the thrill of meeting Pete Seeger. Oh, okay. uh, he, he co-authored a book about the Hudson River and the cleanliness of the river and why it needs to be monitored and stuff oh. like this. So. Uh, this is great, Dixon, that you can buy <laughs> all your books on Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> they have Parasite Life Cycles, which is old, for 150 bucks. Hey! Uh, and they have mugs and uh, water bottles, stainless steel water bottles with... Got Dixon question mark on the side? <laughs> Are you kidding? Oh, That's we hilarious. gotta get. I'm gonna get you one. Got what? Dixon. Look I, at this. I didn't do that. Oh, no, of course, someone else. It probably is any name you search for, and they'll <laughs> yeah. just make it. Yeah. But they're all got Dixon. Got Dixon. That is <laughs> yeah. so funny. And the answer but is no. No, they don't. no photo of you, Dixon. That's too bad. All right. Okay, let me read the last. Chris writes now. Chris is actually uh, early on. Chris is still at the pre Griffin stage of his uh, twip listening. Oh. <laughs> so he doesn't even know I exist yet. So this might come as a shock. If you have not come into there. Okay. So Chris writes, hello, Dr. Rock and Yellow and Dr. De Pommier. You're right. My name is Chris. I've been studying parasite ecology for the last four years at Rutgers. Good place. And I am currently in the process of interviewing for graduate schools in parasitology. I started listening to TWIP earlier this year after a professor mentioned TWIV and TWIP during a lecture. <laughs> I am emailing you to thank you for making such an interesting and educational podcast. I am presently on episode 42 in TWIP and episode 6 in TWIV, and I feel like I have truly grown my scientific knowledge in disease ecology. These two podcasts are just fantastic and are helping to fill a void I have in disease ecology because the last four years, I've spent all my time learning fish parasites and had very little time to learn about human ones. Uh-huh. I think the best quality about these podcasts, besides the interesting stories you tell, is that you repeat everything over and over. No, I added that part. You you two always seem to bring up points from past episodes, which reinforce the details. I love this due to the fact that I mainly listen to these podcasts while at work or doing other activities. So I occasionally miss a detail. But due to you two repeating everything so much, (laughs) (laughs) emphasis emphasis. I added, I get the reinforcement I need to retain the information. So please keep on bringing (laughs) things up from the past. One suggestion I have for the show is that you make a few micro episodes. By this, I mean quick episodes where you do a quick review of a small subject or possibly even an update or subjects past. Just a few quick episodes that don't need an hour plus commitment to finish. (laughs) You guys have been doing these podcasts for almost 10 years, so there are bound to be some updates you could do a quick review on. Once again, I do have a large backlog of episodes, so you may have already started doing this. If so, please ignore my suggestion. (laughs) Please keep it up. I love the shows. And Dr. Dave Pommier, is is there any chance I will be able to find you at ASP this year or the Helminthological Society of Washington held at Penn State this year? I would love to say hi in person. 
One last thing, I am currently writing this in the truck at my job on my phone, so please don't judge my grammar and spelling so harshly. <laughs> Looking forward to catching up on the over 500 episodes I have left. Warm regards, Chris. Way to go, Chris. Nice. He is uh, on the pre-Daniel <laughs> yes. episode. Yeah. Um, he's, he's almost he's almost halfway, right? I came 40. in at 80, so he's just yeah. halfway there. On the you're you're going to make it. Uh, this <laughs> is a, I like this is a good idea, little micro episodes. Right. Because as we heard today, parasites can be microbes, right? Exactly right. Um, so we could just, I mean, there are many ways we could do it. We could yeah. do mm -hmm. it with just one little subject that you want to re-review, re -review, the two of you. Yeah. Like eosinophilia or... Uh, even, you know, you did the first ones, right, that he's listening to, which is where you hit each organism. We did. We could always do like a sort of a 15 minute, um, they, you know, 15 minutes of trypanosomiasis. And then at the end, we can say, minutes. for more, see lecture X of parasitic diseases, which will soon be online, right? So you'll you want could, to know. You could go to both. Like you could go to the clinical one and the yeah. early. Oh, look at us. Yeah. We're getting creative now. now um, I don't know. The lectures will probably be on in january i guess right yeah we think so because we have a lot of work to do right we do you, you by we you mean you, we're done we're done I'm our done. job we, is done well we you have, have to tell me where to insert his we, parts so i'll we'll, we'll sit here we're you gonna and I, create together. with a bottle of 18 whatever and uh we can work on it we'll manipulate. until we can't do it anymore that's right <laughs> okay. we can't see the screen but you have to get over your cold first absolutely because I'll uh, do my best. You're coughing too. All much. I'm doing is thinking about interferon right now, so I should be able to. No, be that's by too tomorrow. late for interferon. What should I be thinking about then? Uh, you should be IgG. thinking of uh, T cells and antibodies. Yeah, T cells and antibodies. You should implore your immune system. I'm imploring it right to help you out. <laughs> it's on All strike. Right. That's our email, and and uh, remember, we're going to give away a book. So guess again. Right. Do an educated guess. Yeah. Twip is at microbe.tv slash twip. Please help us out financially if you can, microbe.tv slash contribute. And if you have case guesses, questions, comments, want to tell us to be nice to Dixon, <laughs> twip at microbe.tv. Daniel Griffin is at, I saw the name of this place today, Columbia University. Uh, well, who's the guy who had it named? Something Medical Center. Columbia University. Do you remember the donor who gave the money to have his name on this? Milstein? Book? Milstein. <clears throat> no, not Milstein. Rosenfield. The other guy. Anyway. Daniel Griffin. Vagilist. Columbia University. <laughs> I Medical am at Center. Columbia University. And he's also at ParasitesWithoutBorders.com. Thanks, Daniel. Oh, it's always a pleasure. Nice to see you in person. Yes, it's uh, yeah. nice to be seen. Nice to see you guys. <laughs> Dixon de Palmier. TheLivingRiver.org. ParasitesWithoutBorders.com. Trichinella.org. Thank you, Dixon. I hope you feel better. Thank you. That's being nice to me. Especially Dixon. by Friday, which is TWIV. You're very nice to me. So I don't have to edit so much. No. I'll and people fine. can come by here to the uh, the Irving Medical Center and see us. Irving, that's Irving it. Medical Center. <laughs> Irving, that's it. Columbia <laughs> University Irving Medical Center. Yes. Uh, that's the name. Herbert, Herbert Irving. Irving. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at Virology. Herbert Florence. Herbert and Florence Irving. <laughs> so let's just get this right. <laughs> you, can f you can find me at virology.ws. The music on TWIP is performed by Ronald Jenkins. RonaldJenkins.com. I want to thank ASM for their support of TWIP. And I want to thank the sponsor of this episode, Blue Apron. Thanks for all your help this year, Blue Apron. Yes. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIP. Is, is parasitic. parasitic.